Inga mana, inga reo, inga tāwera pumanua, ro rakatira ma, tenakoto, tenakoto, tenatato katoa. Um, my name is Harlene Hain, and I have the great privilege of being the Vice Chancellor here at the University of Otago, and it is with great pleasure that I welcome you to our very first inaugural professorial lecture for 2018. I'd like to begin by welcoming academic staff and students and professional staff from around the university, um, and also members and former members of the University Council um, who have joined us here this evening. I'd like to extend a particularly warm welcome to Professor Ritchie's friends, family, and members of the Dunedin music community and the wider community who have all come along this evening to support him on this very auspicious occasion. I am sure um, that your support here is going to be in very, very, very important to him. Now, oftentimes when I introduce our speaker at these inaugural professorial lectures, I sometimes use the word superstar. Our promotion criterion here at Otago are extremely stringent. So in order to achieve the rank of professor, you must be a superstar in teaching, in research, and in service to the university and to the wider community. But tonight, in addition to achieving all of those successes, Professor Ritchie actually is a superstar in the traditional sense of the term. He is a prolific composer with close to 200 original compositions for both instrument and voice. His music has been performed and recorded by top-level artists and ensembles both here in New Zealand and in other parts of the world. Reviewers of his work have routinely heaped praise on his talent. Now, when we sought external input into our decision-making process about making Professor Ritchie a professor, his referees were unanimous in their laudatory comments. We were reminded over and over again that Professor Ritchie is one of New Zealand's top-ranking and internationally established composers. I would also like to take this opportunity to publicly thank you for agreeing to compose an anthem for our 150th year celebration next year. And I know that I speak on behalf of everyone who is here and the rest of the university community, uh, that we are all very much looking forward to hearing that anthem being uh, performed during a gala concert in the town hall over Queen's birthday weekend. So, Professor Ritchie, on behalf of the University of Otago, I would like to congratulate you on your very well-deserved promotion to professor. And I will now call on Associate Professor Peter Adams, who is going to tell us just a little bit more about your journey to becoming professor. Noreira, tenakoto, tenakoto, tenatato, katoa. Vice-Chancellor, Deputy Vice-Chancellors, uh, Pro-Vice-Chancellor, Anthony, Professors, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Anthony Ritchie to you. And the first thing I'd like to say is that Anthony is, I think, unique in New Zealand. We've already heard that he's written so many compositions, but he's also the most performed New Zealand composer behind Douglas Lilburn. Um, and at this very moment, there are rehearsals in place around the country of Anthony's music, uh, whether it's an amateur school choir preparing a choral piece for the Big Sing competition, or whether it's the Auckland Philharmonia Orchestra who will be playing his viola concerto later in the year, you can guarantee that somewhere Anthony's music is being rehearsed, ready to be performed. Anthony uh, is also like father, like son, and this is also a unique aspect of Anthony, is that his father was a professor of music, and his father was one of the first generation New Zealand composers, John Ritchie. And he passed away just a couple of years ago, but I know he would have been absolutely delighted and so proud of his son uh, for achieving the same status uh, as a composer and as a professor uh, of music as 
John Ritchie did. And John had a very long career at the University of Canterbury, and Anthony is already showing the same sort of longevity in his career here at Otago. So, Anthony, as we've heard, has composed, actually it's just over 200 works now, because of course he's written one between, he actually wrote one the other day for my birthday, so thank you very much. <laughs> so that counts. <laughs> Um, Anthony studied at the University of Canterbury, completing a first-class honours in composition, and then he furthered his study um, in the Liszt Academy in Hungary, completing a PhD on the Hungarian composer Bala Bartok. And I think a lot of us in Anthony's earlier compositions would recognise the fingerprint of Bartok in his style, um, before he added the Cook Island drumming and the Pacifica and the rock music to his style. He was composer in schools in Christchurch in 1987. He was the Mozart Fellow here at Otago University in 1988 and again in 1989. And he was um, the composer in residence with the Dunedin Symphony Orchestra in 1993 to 1994. And then he started his lectureship with us in the music department. Um, he's freelanced in the early 1990s, writing many commissioned works, including the Flute Concerto, the Viola Concerto, From the Southern Marches, and two symphonies, all of which have been performed and recorded. The Viola Concerto is to be performed in Auckland later this year, but for something about that Cinderella instrument, the viola, that um, Anthony likes, he's written a second viola concerto, which is to be premiered, uh, is it the end of this year or the beginning? in August this year, so um, uh, that's fantastic. Um, he's written music for theatre and for dance. He's completed three short operas in the, 19, in the 1990s as well. Um, many of his work has been recorded and broadcast, um, and such renowned ensembles as the Ulster Orchestra, the Takax Quartet, uh, soloists such as, such as Bella Histrova, Alexa Still, the flute player. The BBC Symphony Orchestra has recorded his overture, A Bugle Will Do. Uh, his Symphony No. 4, Stations, um, was selected as one of the uh, recordings of the year by Music Web International in 2015. And last year, 2016, he was, sorry, 2016, he was the joint winner of the Classical Album of the Year with Ross Harris, a Wellington composer, for Fajan, In the Distance, a work for clarinet quintet, which was recorded by the Dalakalia Quintet. Just recently, his oratorio Gallipoli to the Somme uh, was performed last year here in Dunedin, and it's about to be performed uh, in London and Oxford and Anthony and our senior lecturer in violin, Tessa Peterson, who has been invited to lead the orchestra in London and Oxford, will be heading off very shortly uh, for those performances, which are in June. Uh, Anthony's also very involved um, with the local community. Just a couple of weeks ago, he conducted a concert with the Otago Symphonic Wind Band of New Zealand composers for May New Zealand Composition Month. Another aspect of Anthony is he likes that vicious game of croquet. <laughs> he has been the Otago champions for seven times, and he's represented New Zealand at two world championships. One in Florida, a member of the New Zealand team, um, in 2009, and then in Adelaide in 2012. Today, his talk is entitled, um, as we can see up ab above me, uh, Composing Music, But Is It Research? When a composer creates music, is he or she doing research? Anthony will endeavour to answer this question while also taking you on a journey through his life and career. He will talk about his creative practice and his striving for a musical voice. You will hear about some of the influences in his life, both musical and non-musical. He will outline what skills you need to be a composer, and these are not all musical. The ability and desire to engage with the other arts, sciences, and life in general is an important part of being a well-rounded composer. He will also talk about innovation and the nature of creativity. Finally, he will talk about the creation of knowledge when composing. What is it we find out when we listen to new music? And along the way, of course, we're going to hear some of Anthony's music. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Anthony Ritchie. Thank 
Thank you very much. Kei aku nui, kei aku rahi, ka, ka mihi ki a koto katoa. Ko araki te maunga, ko wai makareri te awa, no otatahi aho. Ko Anthony toku ingoa, tena koto, tena koto, tena tato katoa. Welcome Vice-Chancellor, uh, Pro-Vice-Chancellor, staff, friends, family. It's great to see so many familiar faces here. Um, I find that some people are puzzled uh, when I tell them that composing music is my main research activity. Surely creating new music is not a form of research. Where are the words? Where's the literature review? And so forth. I hope I can provide answers that will satisfy you that composition is a type of research, a way of searching for and discovering new knowledge. It's also, of course, a creative act, a form of self-expression, and an activity that requires substantial self-discipline. But first, I'll uh, share my research journey with you, how I came to compose music, uh, some of my influences, and how I came to work at this university. Many composers through history have enjoyed working in uh, tertiary institutions, although it's a more recent trend, relatively speaking. One of the reasons we have the glorious New World Symphony of Dvorak's is that he took up a job at the National Conservatory of Music in New York, where he was paid ten times as much as back in Bohemia. Um, the great 20th century composer Arnold Schoenberg shared his knowledge in a book called Fundamentals of Musical Composition, which grew out of his teaching at Californian universities. So with the gradual decline in aristocratic uh, patronage, academies and conservatoires became more natural homes for composers, allowing them to balance their creative solitude with a sharing of knowledge with their students. So after a decade of freelancing, I too joined the ranks of composers in universities and have never regretted it. I was fortunate enough to be born into a musical family, as you've heard already from Peter. The fifth of five children, I was born in Christchurch. Uh, my mother was a singer, a soprano of some renown, singing solos in the Messiah and so forth. Her singing was a constant companion to me, to my early life, and I can blame her for my habit of singing and humming all the time, which drives my wife's bear. <laughs> <laughs> However, I can thank her for this too. There's been research to show that exposure to music in early life is crucial in the development of musicality. And I think the exposure to music, to singing in particular, is uh, especially powerful. My mother also started me on the piano and showed constant faith in my musical abilities. She was of a generation who would have had a more substantial career herself were it not for raising five of us. My father, as Peter has said, was also a composer and a professor. He died 2014 and I'm very sorry that he didn't live to see this day. He was an alumnus of Otago, completing a music degree in just two years during World War II uh, before being sent off to Europe as a fighter pilot. He had the good fortune to go to, a, to, go to school at King Edward Technical, where uh, a musician by the name of Vernon Griffiths was undertaking an extraordinary experiment. He made all the students at the school learn a musical instrument and sing in the choir. No exceptions. You can't imagine that happening these days. <laughs> There they all are. Somewhere in this uh, photo are my parents. They met at King Edward Tech and both became immersed in music at school. My father learnt the cornet, the B-flat bass, the keyboard and the clarinet. He showed musical aptitude and Vernon encouraged him to compose and conduct as well. And after the war, my parents settled in Christchurch where uh, Dad joined the Department of Music at Canterbury. So most people, when they hear this, say you're following in your father's footsteps, which can't be denied, I suppose. However, I can truthfully say that my mother and siblings had a more direct influence on me when I was young than uh, my father, and the simple reason being that Dad was so busy that he was often away. We spent many long hours around the old Valve <laughs> gramophone re record player, here it is. We sold it the other day for $15 on Trade Me. <laughs> Very sad day. So my brother and I, we had an eclectic mix of LPs ranging from Shostakovich and Sibelius 
through to Rhapsody in Blue and T-Rex. In, in my teens, my sister Liz returned home and uh, added show music to the repertoire, cabaret, fiddler on the roof and so forth. I spent long hours listening to the, uh, radio, uh, to the gramophone and hammering on the piano, so much so that I regularly broke strings on it. Um, I found it more interesting to improvise than uh, learning my set pieces, and this was the beginning of my composing around age 11. There is a saying about a person having to spend a thousand hours learning a skill before they produce quality work. And I want to thank my family very much for allowing me that time and space to create at the piano when a teenager. There must have been times when it drove them up the wall. Likewise, my father tolerated me pinching his manuscript paper out of his office to write music. He didn't impose lessons on me too. I think this is interesting. He, he waited till I was 16 or 17 before giving me some harmony lessons, which I found very difficult, incidentally. Up till this point, I just listened to music and, and played it, and uh, my favourites were 20th century composers like Bartok, Stravinsky, Shostakovich, Schoenberg, and Ligeti. In other words, when I was young, I liked dissonance. My brother-in-law called it that bloody awful music. <laughs> Here's an extract from my Opus 1 uh, for solo violin dating from 1976 when I was in the fifth form, which shows this tendency towards dissonance. Now, the violinist here, you, most of you will recognise, is Sidney Manowitz, who taught at Otago University uh, back in these days, back in the 80s. And he picked up this sonata of mine, and it's quite remarkable that he, he played it and recorded it for the radio, completely off his, out of his own volition. And it's a recording I treasure. <laughs> One little bit. <laughs> Having a musical family around uh, meant the idea of becoming a musician didn't seem weird. In fact, I really didn't consider any other career path, to be honest. So I studied at Canterbury University while my father was still teaching there. Now, that, that was a little weird. Um, <laughs> but he endeavoured to keep an objective distance between us. The times I found most valuable with him were when we were attending concerts and talking about this or that composer and this or that piece. I grew up at a time of turmoil for the arts in general. The post-war period up to the 80s will be remembered as a time when everything was questioned, even the very definition of music. In New Zealand, there was a flourishing interest in electroacoustic music, for example, where there was no performer and there was a reel-to-reel -reel tape playing. <laughs> at the same time, uh, many composers were still happy to con write, continue writing melodies and harmonies as before. By the 1980s, the range of musical styles and approaches within the classical world was bewilderingly diverse. As John Cage put it, the history of music in the 20th century is like a river delta spreading out an ever greater number of streams. And this was reflected by the types of teachers I had. There was my father, who wanted me to stay sane in a mad world, as he put it. Uh, my third year teacher, John Cousins, heavily into experimentation with a liking for electronic music and performance art. My fourth year teacher, Chloe Moon, who trod a mid -path, middle path between the conservative and the radical. And finally, when I went to Budapest to study, I had composition lessons with Attila Bozai, a quiet intellectual composer who pushed me towards an atonal style of music. So as a student, I tried to embrace all these diverse elements, but found I was in danger of losing my individuality. In fact, it was John Cousins who encouraged me to block out too many influences and just to focus on what was special about what I did. And I think in today's globally connected world, it's more important than ever for artists to develop their own ideas and to treasure them and not to be overwhelmed by too many influences. My PhD, uh, as uh, Peter said, was on the Hungarian composer Béla Bartók and involved tracing the influence of folk music in his work. This exercise of analysing folk music and how it's used had a profound effect on my own work. 
The idea that folk music is like flora, fauna, constantly evolving and changing over time really interested me. So I tried to do this in my own compositions. I wrote a work called A Folk Lament, which combines the elements of Māori waiata with Hungarian lament. Um, I wrote it for organ, of all things, and it won a prize, resulting in performances and a broadcast by Dame Gillian Weir. The style of this music is atonal. As I mentioned, that's what I was heading towards. That is music without a key centre, no keys, which reflected my teaching. However, I never really felt comfortable working in this style, and when I came back home, I headed back to tonality. One of the results of this was my concertino for piano and strings, written for Otago alumnus Sharon Joy Vogan. This had the honour of being recorded onto an LP in 1984, just before cassettes totally took over. And this in turn led to commissions for the Auckland Philharmonia, and uh, this helped my cause when it came time to applying for the Mozart Fellowship. Um, this was my first contact with Otago in Dunedin. Um, the Mozart Fellowship was a dream come true, a chance to spend all year composing music and being paid for it. It also allowed me to make connections with a new city, playing piano at Dolveston, as in the picture, um, getting to know composers Jack Spears, Peter Adams and John Drummond. See, John's here. I was encouraged by the music department to do some teaching and discovered I had a love for sharing knowledge uh, with young people. Unfortunately, my second year as Mozart Fellow was not so happy with a marriage breakup. And sometimes composing can be good therapy, and other times it's the last thing you feel like doing. I had a commission at the time with a hard deadline from the Dunedin Symphonia, as it was called then, and Nicholas McBride was the, in charge of it then. Uh, and he asked me to write a piece for their opening concert of 1989. Following a period of chaos, I managed to uh, write this commission in two weeks. Uh, a result, the resulting piece was called The Hanging Bulb, um, eventually published by Massey University Press. And although it's a deeply unhappy and personal piece, it's been kind to me. After the premiere, it was picked up by a workshop by the Auckland Philharmonia, recorded onto CD by the New Zealand Symphony Orchestra. And that recording session was an experience I'll never forget. The CD had a limited budget, which meant limited time with the orchestra. In fact, they picked up the music for the first time of this 15-minute piece at 2 o'clock and finished recording it by 4 o'clock. <laughs> As time was nearly up, the, the conductor, Ken Young, was still trying to get a particular rhythm right. I was biting my nails. Uh, and the recording producer was yelling, come on, come on! Um, fortunately, the recording made it by the skin of its teeth. And I offer this as a story, as an example of how uh, fragile the music business can be, depending on circumstances and lucky breaks. The Hanging Bowl reached a much larger audience as a result of this recording. It became a set work for NCEA students, with a resource made by Cheryl Cam, a former Mozart fellow here. And ever since this resource was adopted, I've been fielding questions from high school students asking what the piece is about. <laughs> um, the painting on the cover uh, is by uh, New Zealander Philip Claremont, a very talented artist who sadly died in the 70s. Um, of a, it's from a series of vibrant interior paintings that usually feature light bulbs. In response, to, uh, the music tries to suggest brightness uh, by the high-sounding woodwinds and simultaneously a sense of despair through falling motifs and harmonies that seem locked into repeated rhythms.
following the Mozart Fellowship, I decided to stay in Dunedin, and it was the best decision I'd ever made. Uh, first of all, I met my second wife-to-be, Sandy, who's been a wonderful partner for me for 25 years. And secondly, uh, Dunedin offered many opportunities for a musician. I happily freelanced through the decade and stayed in touch with the university, getting to know a string of interesting Mozart fellows, such as Gillian Whitehead. Um, and I also made a, a living from a succession of commissioned works, some residencies, a little teaching, some conducting, uh, reviewing and judging. I was lucky enough during this period to have taught uh, Tequan Evans and uh, Holly Matheson and Michael Norris, who've gone on to bigger and better things. And uh, Peter mentioned the Southern Marches. That was a significant work for me, written to celebrate the 150th anniversary of Otago and Southland. I also did the uh, Southern Journeys, which is a music for a natural history New Zealand film, the one that played in the airport for many, many years. <laughs> Just stopped it recently. Um, for me, though, my heart lay with symphonic writing. It's been a dream of mine since young to write a symphony. So when I was appointed composer in residence with the Dunedin Symphonia in 93, I seized the opportunity. Here's the first page of uh, my symphony number one. Um, first page of 200, <laughs> which and, uh, I hand wrote and got RSI as a result. Um, symphony Boom, uh, as it's called, uh, demonstrates several areas that I was exploring at the time in my work. First of all, uh, synthesizing small melodic fragments into a coherent whole. Um, also, I was interested in returning to a simpler style, away from my Bartok-based, more dense style. Um, thirdly, I was interested in popular music at this stage, so there's some influences from jazz and rock come in, and the inst influence of some Eastern philosophy. Now, Mahler and Sibelius once famously disagreed about what the nature of a symphony should be. Sibelius said he admired the symphony's profound logic and inner connection. Mahler disagreed by saying, a symphony must be like the world, it must embrace everything. Now I wanted Bum to bring these two ideas together somehow. So I adopted the idea of, of Sibelius' synthesis of motifs, and at the same time I wanted to make a statement about life, the universe, and everything. Um, <laughs> So the title Boom, B-O-U-M, comes from E.M. Forster's novel, A Passage to India, and is a haunting echo that is represented in the music by the tam-tam, or the gong, which is the instrument you see behind me in that photo. The recurring boom symbolizes, for me at least, the extinguishing of the ego, the self, the realization that we humans are but a tiny speck in the natural order of things. The Eastern concept of samsara or reincarnation is also woven into the music, with ideas and sounds being recycled. So as you may be able to tell from this description, I'm interested in program music, that is, instrumental music that has meanings or messages in them. And this approach has been criticised by those who prefer absolute music, or art for art's sake, who see program music as fanciful and romantic, or as Copeland said, almost childlike. <laughs> My belief in the power of program music has come about through observe, observing the reactions of non-musicians to musical experiences. <laughs> Purely instrumental music can stir powerful emotions and images, I think. Think of the searing sonorities of Barber's famous adagio for strings, or the power and drama of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, First Movement, or the sheer joy of living in uh, Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue. As listeners, we all develop our own associations with purely instrumental music. So I prefer to describe my music as semi-programmatic. That is, I create an idea, a specific idea in my own mind and put it into the music, but then you, the listener, can either take it or leave it. You can listen to it as just as pure music if you wish. And this is the beauty of music, after all. It's open to many interpretations. In my symphony, Boom, I also tried to develop a more simple, direct style so as to make these emotions more apparent. And this was partly informed by my experiences in the early 1990s when I connected with live popular music at Sammy's, the Albert Arms and other venues. I sort of had the, uh, the adolescence I never had type of thing. Um, I felt the need to get in touch with the cathartic experience of rock concerts. And this led me to be somewhat dissatisfied with the culture surrounding classical music, the formality of concerts, the restrained emotional responses, 
and the intellectual approach to composition that I observed amongst some of my peers. So technically my music becomes less dense, dissonant and simpler in style. Here's just a little bit of Symphony Bomb towards the end, getting near the climax of the piece. Uh, in my mind it was like a rock concert. sound like rock music. <laughs> Since BOM, I've written uh, three more symphonies and have a fifth in draft form at the moment, which hopefully will be performed uh, in the newly rebuilt Christchurch Town Hall next year. In these and other symphonies, I've explored themes related to politics, history, psychology, religion, disasters, childhood. Around 2000, I began to explore some new directions in my musical style and did so via a set of 24 preludes for piano, which eventually got recorded onto CD by Sharon Vogan. And this involved methods I hadn't tried before, such as the tone clock method and some mathematics. Coincidentally, at this time, I also accepted a half-time contract at the university here, which led to a permanent job. And I guess this takes me back to the question I posed at the start, but is it research? This will be my leitmotif, my recurring theme for the rest of the talk. I would like to show why I think composition is a form of research. When a composer works, they create new sounds. They do this for their own creative pleasure and self-expression. But they, they also do it as a form of communication to impart something to you people, the audience. The composer has no control over the, how the sounds will be received. We talk about the audience as if it's a unit, but of course it's made up of many individuals uh, with many different personalities, uh, experiences, and of course you all hear different things in music. There's a nice parallel to what I'm saying from a chapter uh, on the psychological and physiological aspects of hearing by J.D. Hood, who said, it's worth remembering that when the hi-fi enthusiast, striving for perfection with his sophisticated equipment, twiddles his knobs and dials, all he's doing is to impose upon what he hears, a quality which he finds aesthetically pleasing to himself. So likewise, I twiddle the knobs and dials of my compositions and try to communicate with the audience, but in the end, what they take out of it is over to them. Moreover, I would say music is not a universal language, despite the global spread of Western popular music. It is culturally defined. Therefore, in order for my music to connect, there has to be a set of shared <coughs> musical signals with the audience. And in order to develop these shared signals, a composer has to be part of a community, and, and it's musicking, to use the uh, word of Christopher Small. To reach a stage, this stage, a, a composer has to have mastered the craft of composition. So as with any researcher, there are a wide, wide range of technical skills required before any significant creative work can be done. And I thought it might be just worth pointing these out. Uh, the mastering of a musical instrument is very important. The ability to improvise fluently. Mastering of a written musical language, musical notation. Development of an inner ear through lots and lots of listening, ideally singing as well, and school reading. The ability to sight read fluently on an instrument is incredibly valuable for a composer. <coughs> and finally, the development of an aesthetic through many repeated listenings to music, and sometimes the same piece of music over and over and over again. All this leads to what Zachary Dunbar calls know-how, the knowledge that is built up inside us through formal practice so that we operate instinctively with it, like riding a bike, I guess. This accumulated instinctive knowledge is essential for the development of a musical voice or style. All good and well, but why is it research? 
when I sit down and write a new piece of music, am I researching? I'm certainly creating something new that didn't exist before, an original composition, as opposed to a plagiarized one. <laughs> but there is experimentation and new knowledge, is there new experimentation and new knowledge being created? Well, I'd say if my uh, musical style had stayed the same as my Opus One violin sonata, then no, you couldn't claim that my composition was research. Creative artists have to try new approaches and methods to innovate. I'll come back to the word innovation shortly, but it is worth pointing out historically that some of the greatest composers have written to order, be it the church, patron or theatre, and have often stuck to a formula for efficiency's sake. So not every one of Rossini's 39 operas are original masterpieces, and one could argue that most of them these days wouldn't qualify as research, because we're in all likelihood dashed off in a hurry in following a formula. However, recomposing similar ideas, uh, trying them out in different contexts, is actually a natural part of composing. Just as jazz musicians take an idea and, and uh, play around with it, uh, so composers develop their ideas uh, through lots of repetition. Uh, they develop their voice, their musical DNA. It's not a sign of laziness, but rather it can be seen as a composer's preference for certain patterns. A collection of these preferences develops into a style or an aesthetic. The analogy I would make is that of uh, a scientist who sets out with a hypothesis and has to run an experiment several times, maybe with different uh, conditions, to produce slightly different results each time. This leads me back to the question of innovation, a word that's much used in art circles and is the cornerstone of funding agencies such as Creative New Zealand. Innovation and research go hand in hand, um, but innovation is a surprisingly tricky concept to pin down in the arts. For example, every composer I know has influences and their music can sound somewhat similar to someone else. There are many examples of composers creating themes that are rather similar to each other's in his book on composition, Schoenberg highlights three, three of these. One by Mozart, famous theme from his 40th symphony. One by Beethoven, is one of his early piano sonatas. And one by Mendelssohn, a string quartet. Let's listen to them. It's the Mozart. It's Beethoven. Mendelssohn. So, do we need to get the lawyers in? <laughs> uh, not at all. Beethoven and Mendelssohn were both influenced generally by Mozart, and the similarities of these themes are probably subconscious rather than a deliberate borrowing. When you are thoroughly immersed in a rich musical culture, ideas tend to be pinged around a lot and shared. And in any case, what Beethoven and Mozart, uh, Mendelssohn did with their themes was very different to Mozart. After World War II, composers and artists turned themselves upside down in a search for innovation. Any conceivable noise or sound could be employed, or you could have a completely silent piece. Um, so when it comes down to it, however, the thing that will distinguish one composer from another is a collection of aesthetic choices the composer makes, and not necessarily whether there is a great novelty in each piece. So I think innovation can be better defined as an attitude that says this. I'm personally willing to try things I haven't tried before, and I am willing to experiment. Willingness to change, willingness to try different methods, is something we see in the greatest artists and composers. Beethoven is a good example in the music world, Picasso is a good example in the visual world, and Joyce in the literary world. They were what we would call blue sky thinkers. The willingness to change and innovate in composition is something that we might associate more tangibly with research. In my own work, uh, I've tried, these are the three examples, um, mathematical concepts, as I mentioned before, using magic squares uh, and golden ratio to structure pieces. Now, these are not uh, my inventions. They've been used by other composers, but they were new for me. Transcription and recomposition is another uh, method um, that I've used, uh, so for example, recording bird call, uh, transcribing the bird call down, weaving it into a piece of music. Um, and minimalism, so the reduction of music to its uh, basics, and this has been a trend in music in the last 30 years and has influenced me uh, through performance as, as well as academic research. 
Even my method of composing has changed in the last 30, uh, 20 years since buying my first program for a computer. Uh, my wife Sandy, who's a tech whiz, helped me to set up an Acorn computer for Sibelius version 1 in 1994, uh, following that bout of RSI I mentioned, actually. Actually, it was much kinder on the hands. Uh, and since then, the playback function has improved, and it's now possible to get a reasonable idea of how the piece actually sounds before being performed. It also allows for some experimentation uh, in the music score as it unfolds. And I thought it might be interesting to show a, uh, an extract of music that uh, I did on the MIDI, on the computer first of all, and then what it sounded like in performance, live. Um, the extract I've chosen is from Gallipoli to the Somme, which Peter mentioned before. Uh, one of the first choruses sung by City uh, Choir Dunedin, and of course the Dunedin Symphony Orchestra accompanying. Ete ope tuatahi, uh, Sir Aparan and Nata's words for the first Māori battalion. So here's the, uh, what I hear on the computer. That's probably enough of that. Yeah. <laughs> um, those are the voices, uh, but of course they, don't, they haven't developed the skill of mimicking words yet, or at least I don't think they have. Um, so here's the, uh, the real thing. So a composition that puts new ideas into practice can be viewed as a more tangible form of research, I think. Dunbar talks about a purposeful dialogue between theory and practice, resulting in practice as research. And this is now the model that is encouraged for creative DMAs and PhDs at the university. And it allows composers and performers to undertake postgraduate study involving both their practice and their academic research. For example, one of my DMA students, Trevor Coleman, put forward a theory about organising music into cycles of rhythms and metres, and then put this theory into practice with three innovative albums of music. I've noticed another change in my own method in recent years. I like to take longer thinking about the creative work to be done. And part of this thinking involves research and reading. I've just mentioned Gallipoli to the Somme, and this is an obvious example to use here too. Preparation for this work involved quite a lot of things. Uh, obviously reading the book of the same name uh, by Alexander Aitken, the soldier who, who went to Gallipoli and the Somme. Uh, researching his background and his friends, uh, meeting his friends and relatives. Uh, also researching other texts related to the First World War, poems, letters, diaries, which then I set to, to music, building a structure out of those different texts. It also involved talking to uh, war, war historians, Chris Pugsley, Kate Kennedy and others. And archivists like David Murray helped me look, look at some old war music. Uh, and consultation with people in my own department. Uh, Rob Burns, who lo kindly loaned me uh, material, uh, Suzanne Little, um, all these things. And in fact, uh, I'm uh, now working on a book chapter on the, on the theme of how war is represented in arts and music portrayal of violence in, in it. I like to spend time also thinking about the actual performers I am writing for. So classical composers do not generally play all the instruments they write for, <laughs> um, though some have tried, but uh, uh, they research their capabilities and characteristics. However, there is a danger of becoming divorced from real performers, especially in these days of computer playback midis and so forth. Therefore, I like to stay connected with performers as much as possible. 
In Gallipoli to the Somme, for example, I worked with the uh, orchestra's concertmaster, Tessa Peterson, on her solo part and adopted suggestions she made, because after all, she knows her instrument a lot better than I do. Um, and therefore, this process of composition is not necessarily solitary. It's, uh, in fact, I've enjoyed many happy uh, collaborations over the years with other colleagues. Helene Duplessis, Terence Dennis, Tom McGrath, John Van Buskirk, Peter Adams, many others who, sorry if I haven't mentioned people, but uh, uh, it's been a joy. One of the joys of being a composer is working with so many talented uh, musicians. Here's another one, Tequin Evans, conducting a, a recording session with me. So far, I've talked about my creative practice, the development of a musical voice, striving for innovation, the thinking and researching that informs my work, and collaboration with other artists. I would like to return to one of the questions I asked at the start, which was, where is the new knowledge? In order to qualify as research, it could be argued composition should produce new knowledge and impart it to the audience. Now, when music collaborates with the other arts, literature, for example, it's much clearer to grasp where that new knowledge might lie. I've enjoyed many fruitful collaborations with writers over the years. Uh, for example, my opera, This Other Eden, was a collaboration with uh, Michael Ann Forster. And this opera reveals narratives from 1820s New Zealand and biculturalism, and puts it in a new light. However, when uh, no text is involved, when the music is purely instrumental, how do we gauge the new knowledge then? I think we have to apply a broad and a definition of what knowledge is. And here's one from the Oxford Dictionary. Uh, awareness or familiarity gained by experience of a fact or situation. A very simple one, but experiencing uh, an instrumental piece of music in concert can lead to a new awareness, I believe. This is more likely to be an emotional awareness than a cognitive one. Feelings rather than facts. Although I have to say musicians can and do listen to music uh, in a, as an intellectual exercise, analysing harmonies and structures as they go. Exactly what we become aware of, though, when we're listening, uh, can be intangible, because as I said before, instrumental music is not specific in its meaning. Hence, it's difficult to talk about specific knowledge being gained. However, I think music at its best can help uh, create narratives in our minds to help us contemplate our lives or contemplate issues or release emotions uh, that may be lurking below the surface. In other words, it can help us to know ourselves and the relation our relationship with the world. I also think music and the arts reside in what I call the shadows of doubt. That is, they deal with both tangible knowledge and intangible knowledge. My teacher, John Cousins, once compared composers to shamans, saying their role in society was somewhat similar to the old keepers <laughs> of spiritual knowledge. Whereas the sciences focus on ra the rational, the arts deal with both the rational and the irrational. They, deal and uh, they question and challenge us, delve into uncertainty and doubt, as well as providing pleasurable and meaningful experiences. And yes, knowledge. I've just fin finished reading a fascinating book by Steven Pinker, uh, Enlightenment Now, in which he advocates for the humanities and sciences coming closer together for their mutual benefit. And I have to say, I agree. I think this is probably a way forward in challenging times. Another important part of research is reflection. After a premiere, uh, I reflect on my creation to see if it succeeds, look for improvements. So I develop some self-knowledge, in other words. I can learn a lot from the physical reality of a performance, the people around me in the audience, the nature of the performance, and the acoustic. All these can influence my own perception of whether the music has worked or not. I'm also interested in what performers and listeners think, so I talk to them. And I also regard it as a part of my research to find out uh, what other people think, and this includes uh, reading reviews. Now, this is not always easy, as some critics like to criticise. My piano concertina was once described as having a slight but genuine lyrical charm and some cleanly rinsed memories of neoclassical stories. Roger Colville. <laughs> um, so as a 24-year-old, this hurt somewhat. Um, but, but then, on the other hand, it's very nice to be affirmed by the critics. Uh, and, of course, I take these, all thing, these things to heart and think about them.
30 years later, when my Symphony 1 and 2 were released on CD, uh, the British reviewer Nick Barnard made this summary of my musical style, uh, which is unusual to get a big review like this, and he, uh, he finished it in this way. He strikes me as a part of a small elite group of composers who found a personal musical language that takes elements of contemporary musical culture, whether classical, ethnic, or popular, and fuses them into works that speak with a relevance and depth to audiences who might otherwise feel contemporary music was too unapproachable. But she's music speaks with a very individual yet accessible voice. I wish I had a dollar for the number of times my music's been described as accessible. Yeah. <laughs> But the implication of this, of course, is that a lot of contemporary classical music isn't that accessible. And sometimes this often seems to be true. My music is accessible because it uses some materials that people are familiar with from the past. Melodic lines, triadic bass chords, pulse bass rhythms. It doesn't sit in the minimalist camp or the complexity camp, which are two significant trends in the last 30 years. Classical music itself is constantly evolving and adapting, and despite rumours of its death, it maintains a vibrant life. And for me, the key to classical music's health is a willingness to engage with its audiences. In my own music, I want to invite you people in. I don't see the merit in, in snubbing you. Um, I think I, I still want to make strong statements about what it is to be human, and I want people to think about issues, but I also want them to enjoy the sounds. I guess a good example of this, coming back to Gallipoli to the Somme, is uh, uh, the song Alan's Vigil, um, in which I aim to make it very simple uh, so that the, the message is uh, uh, got across very clearly. And in this and other recent works, I've been exploring the idea of a type of artistic naivety almost as a way of conveying strong messages. So let's have a, a, a little listen to. Uh, Alan's Vigil, um, just the first part, sung beautifully by one of, one of our finest graduates, Annalise. I hope I've convinced you today that composition is a form of research and that it contributes to a body of knowledge. I feel very lucky to have uh, had such a good network of musicians and supporters here in Dunedin, New Zealand and overseas. Um, I'm looking forward to the performances of Gallipoli to the Somme in London and Oxford in June and I thank the university for their support for me going there. I want to thank the academic and general staff in the uh, Department of Music, Theatre and Performing Arts for all their support over the years. Composing can be a lonely job at times, like any form of research, and projects can seem to take forever to come to fruition. So researchers really do appreciate being reminded occasionally that what they do is worthwhile, even though people from outside mightn't assume we need that type of boosting. I want to thank my family uh, for all their support too, and finally I want to thank the university for its support over 18 years, showing faith in what I do.
It's very much appreciated. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tony Ballantyne and I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor Humanities and it's really with great pleasure that I deliver this vote of thanks to Professor Ritchie. Uh, Anthony has delivered a, I think a truly excellent lecture uh, providing us with rich insights into the development of his musical sensibility and taking us on a journey with him through the development of his composition practice. He's offered an engaging and I have to say extremely humble set of reflections on the significance of his work. I also think that Anthony's lecture has demonstrated many of the qualities that make him such a respected figure in our arts community as well as in the university and I think the warmth of your applause underscores that. Uh, he is thoughtful, he is imaginative and he is engaging. He has offered us a compelling set of reflections on the interplay between the creative arts and society, I think in a really compelling fashion. I was particularly struck by Anthony's rich evocation of his early life and his pathway into composition. And I think there is real value in hearing such narratives. Scholars, researchers and composers are not born, born fully formed. They are shaped by complex and shifting sets of personal relationships accidents of time and place. And in the case of composers, as Anthony's shown us, the development of a distinctive aesthetic, which develops over time through their engagement with a range of traditions, through reading, uh, through personal exploration, and of course, in the case of music, through listening, practicing, and performing. And as he's shown, over time, uh, they hone and rework a unique voice produced by the accumulation of choices that they have made. Thus, he has offered us a, a kind of sneak peek into his creative practice. It is clear that it isn't all a matter of looking pensive and then being moved by lightning bolts of inspiration, <laughs> but rather it involves knowledge, experimentation, and a lot of hard work. Um, so I would ask you to join me in thanking and congratulating Anthony and in celebrating his promotion to Professor. I have a small gift to present to him, but I would also like to invite you all to accompany the academic party to the staff club and to join Anthony in this very special occasion. So thank you. <laughs>